You guys took a quick look at that sample example yesterday um, that kind of like began the concept of torque. And what you recognized were that there were two things, two things that affected the torque. What were they? There were two parameters that mattered yesterday in that experiment or whatever you call it. Yeah. Was it mass and uh, the plug? Yeah, mass and the position or distance from the rotational axis. Right? So the mass affected it and the distance from the fulcrum where it was, you know, balanced on. Now, obviously we know that mass causes weight, so we could also say that it was like the weight that did it. But we know that those are hanging masses, so we said mass. But weight, mass, in this sense, there's no difference here because they both cause torque. So we're going to look at what's called a point mass and an extended mass. We're going to calculate torque, and then we're going to look at what's called rotational equilibrium. Okay, to, 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 to take a look at net torque. Start with the definition of torque. So for torque, we're going to start with a force applied at a given distance from a fixed point. Now, this traditionally causes some sort of a rotation. Um, if the object is fixed in place, it will probably not cause rotation, but it will cause the object to bend. Um, one, of the, one of the most basic structures for civil engineering and structural engineering is a cantilever beam. Anybody ever hear that term before, cantilever beam? Do you know what it is? Cantilever beam, a good example of one, would be like a diving board. It's fixed at one end, but the other end is completely free to be like this, right? To be, uh, you know, bendy or fluctually not, not rigid. Um, an example of a cantilever beam would be the flagpole outside. Think about the flagpole outside. It's supported, though, okay? So it's not necessarily cantilevered into the wall, but there's fixed at one end, and there's like a little support under the flagpole. So there is a little bit of like, you call it like a brace, a reinforcement to hold it there. But because it's only fixed at one end is what a cantilever beam is, well, here, where this dot is on the left is where the axis of rotation is. So we could say that, you know, it's really like it's fixed right here. Now, if this were a bolt or a pin, in engineering you use pins to model things. You say it's a pin joint. So if, it's, if there's a pin going through right here and it's free to rotate, this force would cause this to rotate like this. And think about it logically, right? Put your hand out like this. Okay, so here is, let me, uh, here's, the, here's the pin, my elbow. Here's the force. I push down. My arm rotates that way. That's the way this would rotate. This would rotate, what would you call it? Terminology? Clockwise. clockwise. This figure would show rotation clockwise. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, the, th the angle theta in this problem is the angle between the actual force applied and the line drawn along the distance. Have you guys gotten into sine and cosine in your Algebra 2 trade class yet? No, but we did a little last year. You did do a little last year, absolutely. So you learned about the basics of Sokotoa and right triangle trade last year. This year you're going to learn about what's called the unit circle and how angles have cyclical nature, or the sine and cosine waves have cyclo cyclical nature based on the uh, based on the actual angle that they're using. So what you'll see here, and I'll just give you a quick demonstration of what I'm saying. Let's assume that that angle is 120 degrees. Type in on your calculator real quick, sine of 120. Make sure you're in degree mode, please. Go ahead and type in your calculator, sine of 120. 0.866, approximately, right? There's a bunch of other decimal spots. So that was the sine of 120. Now, let's say that for some reason, when I was doing my homework, I thought of, okay, well, I'm calling this theta over here. Because according to the definition that I gave you just now, it's the angle between the force applied and the direction of the distance. Well, the distance itself continues along this direction. So which theta is it really? It turns out that it doesn't matter in this case. Try sine of 60 now, because that's what would be left over, right? 120 and 60 is 180? Same thing. Same thing. You're going to learn about that this year, that the sine of an angle and the sine of its supplement are the same thing. So for example, the sine of 95 degrees is the same as the sine of 85 degrees. Why? Because those angles add up to how much? 180. The sine of 150 equals the sine of 30. The sine of 110 
equals the sine of 70. You haven't gotten to this topic yet in math, so I'm kind of giving you this knowledge ahead of time. It would be very simple if you had already learned that, I could just tell you, well, you know, the supplement is the same thing. So what I'm getting at though is this. The angle theta is between the force and the distance along that, or the line along that distance. It doesn't matter which side of the force it's on. Okay? So I gave you theta on the left hand side, if it was on the right hand side, you would just do sine of whatever that supplement was, and you'd get the same answer anyhow. So it really does not affect you. Um, we have to consider the fact that torque is a vector quantity, like velocity, displacement, uh, not like distance or speed, which the direction didn't matter. So in this case, you told me a moment ago that this would spin which way again? Look at the diagram. Which way would this spin if it was free to spin? Clockwise. Again, the pin is here on the far left of the rod. This rod or this beam we consider to be massless. We'll talk about why that is. So this would be considered to be moving clockwise. Traditionally, clockwise is thought of as the negative direction. Counterclockwise is considered the positive direction. So let's write that down. Okay? So let's write down the nomenclature or the generic, um, not nomenclature, the understanding that we'll use that clockwise is considered negative and counterclockwise is considered positive torque. God bless you. Counterclockwise is positive? Yes. Which would be... No, you know, when I went to school for engineering, that's literally how we learned it, believe it or not. And I even looked in your text, and your text does it that way. I've never looked up the reasoning as to why, but I would think it would be the other way. Because yeah. I would think, oh, follow the clock. It's like you're moving to the right. We consider the right positive. I would think that. But this has been the adoption that physicists and engineers have used for forever, really. So just for me, it's just to get to people who don't know physics very well. Yes. I mean, I don't know. It doesn't matter in the end, Beto. That's the thing. So it really doesn't make a difference. It's like, remember I told you how I could call left positive and right negative. As long as I'm consistent throughout my solution to one problem, it doesn't matter which is negative or positive. It's just arbitrary, really. Okay? You can't say down, though. Because look, counterclockwise goes down on the left, doesn't it? You can never use down, up, left, or right for clockwise or counterclockwise. Clockwise does all four directions. Watch. At the top, clockwise is going right. At the right, it's going down. At the bottom, it's going left. At the left, it's going up. So it takes on every direction at any point. So you can't really, that's why you can't use left and right. Okay? Clockwise and counterclockwise. All right, so that is a torque produced by one simple force acting on the actual member. You could have multiple forces acting on them, and we'll see how to come up with those solutions in a little bit. What's important to recognize, though, is that there's also something called a lever arm. And I'm going to talk about that in a moment. But let me give you a little simple example okay, to make this obvious. I want to open the door, OK? I'm outside. So I want to open this door. I push over here. It's pretty simple to open the door. I push over here, and it's harder to open the door. I push all the way in here. I have to really push to open the door. It's almost impossible. And as you get closer and closer to here, it's getting harder and harder. Why is that again? Because you're, I, I don't know how to connect the right now, but you're, you're pushing it farther away from where the hinge is, and thus you are having more, I guess, torque on the, on the hinge. Yeah, so further out, the more torque. So as I move inward, Beto moved outward as a statement. So if I moved outward, as Beto was saying, like, this is really hard to hold the door. It really is, actually. Like right here, it's almost, you know, I'm really pushing to hold this. But here, I can hold this with a simple finger, right? Over here, you're less. So as I move outward from the hinge, I'm increasing R. Look at the diagram, that's R. This is the hinge. The pin that you're seeing in the diagram, it's this hinge. Look, imagine looking at this door from above. A bird's eye view, you're looking down at the door. The pin is here. Here's the top of the door. I was pushing on the outside of the door, then I was pushing in the middle of the door, then I was almost pushing on the hinge. As I get closer and closer to the hinge here, my lever arm, my R value decreases. And okay? my R value decreases. So your goal, and you saw this in the experiment you did yesterday, when the weights were placed further from that rotating axis, it had a lot more effect. It made a lot more torque. So the torque increases as R increases. Okay, the torque increases as R increases. You should know obviously that the torque increases as F increases. What's F? F represents 
the force. You push harder, more torque. Yet location is not as obvious, okay? So you want to be as far from the rotating axis as possible or pretty much increase R as much as possible. Now, let's figure this out. What if my force, instead of being drawn this way, take a look, draw a force this way. Draw it perfectly perpendicular. Make this F here. Well, what's the angle when it's perpendicular? What's the sine of 90? Anybody know that one? One. It's just one. Okay? Sine of zero is zero. The sine of 90 is just one. So here's the angle 90 degrees. So what does my formula become when I'm at a 90 degree angle? RF. Just RF. Again, my formula is RF sine theta. Again, my formula here is RF sine theta. But without the sine theta in place, because sine of 90 is just 1, I don't need that any longer. So it just becomes RF. Okay, it just becomes RF. Can somebody do me a favor? I don't think I included this formula in the formula sheet because I didn't use this topic last year. Could you check real quick? Check your formula sheet and just let me know. Thanks, Willow. I see you checking. It is there? Ah. Oh. That's great, because I didn't even cover torque last year. I don't know why I put it there. Where did I locate it? That's wonderful. Okay. Thank God. Because you know, well, because they're all laminated. Yeah. It takes forever to laminate those things. So I did the formula sheet the first year I was here, made like two corrections or two changes in the next year, relaminated another 40 sheets, because there's like 40 of you juniors, or at least in the two classes. So I didn't want to, have to do it again. All right, that's great. Really what lever arm means. Okay, really what it means. So... I'm going to wrench to demonstrate this because that's what we're using on the board. You know, you can see it in the diagram that's going to happen here. So, in this problem or in this situation, we're looking at the angle that you apply the force to. Okay, the angle that you apply the force to. So, what's happening here is there's a bolt. You want to loosen the bolt. We can see that the first diagram tells us the maximum torque is produced when the force is perpendicular to the wrench when theta is 90 degrees. I don't know why. Did I get rid of this little symbol on yours? It was a diagram I used from your book. No. Is there a little symbol next to yours? Yeah. I covered it up in my nose. I don't know why that infinity symbol is there. It's so weird. It should be a degree symbol. It must have been a mistake in the diagram. So ignore the infinity symbol, please, then. So the angle theta, when it's 90 degrees, gives you a sine of 90 to be 1, which was where RF comes from. Try the sine of anything else in your calculator. Do sine of anything besides 90, seriously. From 0 to 180, let's not go down on anything. Anything from 0 to 180. And please, everybody try something different. Just shout out your answers or give me your answers. Go ahead. 0. 0.6. 0. 0.6. What else? 0. 0.5. 0. 0.5. 0. 0.5. 0. 0.98. 0. 0.8. 0. 0.8. 0. 0.99. Are any of these more than one? No. no. None of these are more than one, right? They're all fractions. So if you take the sine of some angle besides 90 degrees, your torque has to be less than if it were 90 degrees. Again, when I have 90 degrees as my angle, the sine of 90 is 1. That is the maximum value of the sine function. The sine function does this. Ready? Just so you know. It rises up to 1, it drops to negative 1, and it's cyclical. It continues forever, indefinitely. But its maximum possible value for the sine function is 1. So the sine of 90 will give you a value of 1. The sine of anything else will give you a fraction or a decimal. And as a result, as a result, we know that 90 will give us the maximum torque produced. So that's the first diagram at the top left. Now, let's say I'm trying to rotate a bolt and it's on this desk, right? And I lock into the bolt and I push up with 90 degrees. I'm doing a lot with the torque. Now, as I get to the top, I should still be pushing at 90 degrees. Look at my arm. It's still at 90 degrees with the wrench. See how I'm moving my arm with it? So if somebody knows what they're doing with the torque, they'll push with the, with the wrench to do with 90 degrees. Now, what if the bolt is in the top of the table and you're rotating it? You would want to pull with 90 degrees this way or push and keep it tangent to the circle. Think about it. If I push this, it's a circular motion, right? So my arm should be tangent to the circle. Here's the radius of the circle. The circle completes itself. My arm would be tangent, like the tangential velocity from last section. So I'd be pushing like this. But what happens if the wrench were here 
and I'm pushing at this angle, I'm not getting a lot of leverage. By pushing at this angle, I get a lot more leverage on it. But pushing at an angle like this, this angle here is getting smaller and smaller. Eventually, if I actually had the, hypothetically, right, I would never do this, but say I, you know, put this around the head of the bolt, and I wanted to push this wrench. Normally I push it like this, but for some reason, let's say I push this way. Literally this way. What's going to happen? Here's the bolt right here in place, and I push it along the lever arm. Nothing's going to happen at all. Maybe I'll slip and it'll start to move, right? But if I push at an angle such that that theta gets close enough to become zero eventually, you get no torque out of it at all. It makes sense, too, if you think about it. The only way to get torque is to push at some sort of an angle to rotate something. But if the object of rotation is in the middle here, and I push this way, is this rotating the wrench? Like, imagine this is here. The only way to rotate this is to do that, right? To rotate it around like that. If I push like this, I'm not rotating the bolt in the middle. I'm pushing against the bolt, which would cause what's called sheer stress. The bolt might snap. You might literally rip the head of the bolt off if you push hard enough this way. It would snap off the body. But if I went like this at an angle, it would cause it to rotate. Or down like this way, yeah. you get nothing out of it again. Because again, I, 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 you know what I should do? What I'll do is in the next two days, I'll get a piece of wood and I'll put a bolt through and let you all try it out so you can see. So you can physically, it's simple to do, but just so you can literally see how much more torque you get. But I'll, I'll do that in the next two days. I'll put it through. But yeah, so if you push up, right, here's the head of the bolt on the table, I'm assuming. The bolt head is coming out of the table and the bolt goes through the table. So if I wanted to loosen a bolt, I would turn this way. If I lift up, it's not gripping the head anymore. The head of the bolt is literally inside of here. Let me just grab a bolt so you can see exactly what I'm showing you, too. It's going to make more sense on this. Is it? so many different types of fasteners. You have nails. Nails are the weakest. Then you have screws. Screws are strong, but somewhat still weak. A bolt is neck strongest. It will hold something in place because you can tighten it and loosen it. After that, you have things called rivets that actually the bottom end, when you push through it, it explodes, so it's permanently fixed there. So a bolt is made to be, you know, tightened and loosened. So here's the nut. This is called the nut. This is called the bolt. So. When you place the head of the wrench on the bolt, it will fit right around it. So I cannot rotate this bolt right now. But what I can do is if the bolt were here, I can easily rotate the head of the bolt. Do you see how the bolt moves with the actual wrench? As I rotate, the bolt itself turns. So if I had this in place like this, and I lift it up, it would slip off. If I push down, there's nothing there. If I had this in place like this, and I push that way, I'm not rotating the bolt. I'm literally just causing stress on the bolt. The only way to cause the bolt to turn would be to rotate this way. So I need some sort of an angle. As that angle gets closer to 90 degrees, you get more and more torque. So if I were you, I would probably write down the fact that as theta goes from 90 to 0, your torque decreases. Or write the opposite. Again. As theta goes from 90 to 0, the torque decreases. And the reason is because, is because of what's called the lever arm. The lever arm. Let me explain this concept of a lever arm. Okay, the lever arm is thought of as R sine theta. R sine theta. And the lever arm is called the perpendicular distance from the axis of rotation to a line drawn along the direction of the force. So let me explain with a simple diagram. So here's the bolt right here. 
you know, some piece of wood or something, some sort of an object. Actually, let's just call that a pin for now. Let's call that a pin. We'll say this object's force is applied. Mm. Let's say the force is applied at an angle like this. Okay, so here's theta right here now. This is the actual R value right here. And that's theta right there. This is a force being applied. Well, and you don't have to like necessarily know exactly what I'm going to show you. It's going to be a little bit of a trig proof or a trig example. But the concept here is this. If I want to know what the lever arm is, I need to extend that bolt indefinitely, uh, that force indefinitely. So go ahead and take your force line and just extend it. This is the second part of the definition to a line drawn along the direction of the force. So draw a line along the direction of the force. Now, if you were to connect the pin to that line and make a 90 degree angle, it could only happen one way. It could only happen from here 